Stefan Kinsel, it's always a pleasure to meet yes, you in the, in the digital cloud. Yes, that's right. How you doing? <clears throat> well, I'm fine, but we just talked about that. Oh, I guess we're live, so we have to say it again. Yeah, we have repeat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, listen, this, this hang up out comes about because we had this brilliant discussion yesterday, which we will never be able to repeat. Uh, and there was a sense of all around regret that the world did not hear it. That's right. But if Superman flies away from the Earth fast enough, he can maybe get past the light waves and reconstruct what we said. I mean, there's a possibility. I'm trying to follow what you just said, but I can't. Um, the, so, <laughs> but, but the issue. Look, the, and, I, and it all comes down to this, okay? So I, I, I did this, I did this, um, I presented you with a problem, right? And it's like a conjectural issue, okay? It was mm -hmm. like, what if I said the following thing to you, which I may or may not believe? And it is this, that <clears throat> the most spectacular technologies of our time are, are open source, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, technologies that live on distributed networks. And, uh, and and this and this is the basis of 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 the blockchain, you know, with 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 cryptography and and Bitcoin and the emerging cryptocurrencies. This is the basis of of uh, software development, um, you know, in in server server software, and and so, so many other things. Like so many things are going this sort of open source route. So I I said to you. <coughs> Within the within the framework of libertarianism, people are, have have for you know hundreds of years thought that there are really two things. There's public uh, property. There's like state, which is by which I mean state owned, state controlled, and there's private property, which is proprietary, owned by me, uh, controlled by me, uh, or other private parties, right? So, but this distributed network, uh, living on a peer to peer network and with open source development, is a kind of a community project. It's it's like authentic public property in a sense but it excludes the state. Um, and, and it's not really private property in the sense that that, that word's typically been, been used, in the mm -hmm. sense of like controlled by one, one, one person. So, so my proposition is that in the, in, the, in the middle to late stages of the digital age, that maybe we're sort of moving beyond these old categories and exploring this new realm that's completely unlike anything we've seen so far. So, um, and, um, and I put that to you, and you resisted that idea. Well, I think you were struggling with a way to have a definition or a language that we can use to describe uh, the new phenomena that we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe my answer is a little retrograde, a little bit conservative, because I'm trying to stick with the old model and admitting that there's changes that we have to take into account. But at a certain point in time, a quantitative change becomes a qualitative change, right? It becomes such a difference that it's a new thing altogether. Um, I think what you're getting at is the public goods idea, really. You're getting at the idea that there are public goods. Now, for some reason, standard economists have an uneasiness with the idea of public goods because they have this fear that there's not enough incentive structures that they're comfortable with to keep, to keep them coming, right? They see the tragedy of the commons. They see free rider effects, et cetera. They're used to the basic explanation model of a scarce world type of economy where private owners of private scarce resources have the incentive to reap the benefits of it, and they capture primarily the benefits of owning those resources. So if there's a free rider effect, we can neglect it. But they look at it as a problem, um, and there's enough of a private capturing effect to make it work. And then they try to analogize these increasingly public or intangible issues to that type of system that they're comfortable with. And then when, it, when they think it breaks down, then they start advocating things like intellectual property and government subsidies for the arts and the state right. having the monopoly of uh, taxation and jurisdiction over a given area, forcing everyone to pay for defense in an area because there's free rider effects and all these kinds of things. So I think maybe there's a flaw in the very beginning, and that is this obsession with the public goods problem. Looking at it as a problem rather than as one of the benefits of being part of society and human cultural civilization. Um, right. So, uh, with with your uh, with my under my my suggestion here, I'm I'm saying that um, 
these new technologies have kind of changed in the, the old-fashioned categories of property. But your point is that actually property is, uh, there's always been a public element to all private property relations. I mean, I, I, th I think you even said yesterday, look, that's what the invisible hand is, basically. I mean, the, 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 the distributed network and open source development uh, structures and processes are nothing other than the invisible hand at work. Uh, this, so well, this is not a new thing. It's not new, um, and it's also inherent in the uh, sort of uh, common sense subjectivist Mangarian, you know, Austrian idea of the subjective theory of value. The common sense, uh, the common interpretation of a trade is that there's equal value exchange for equal value. Right. Right. But you and I know that that's not the case. That every time there's an exchange, both parties are better off, and therefore society is better off. There's actually wealth created. With every single exchange, and there's a there's a social element to every private economic act. Well, I'm not saying I don't know if it's social, but what I'm saying is there's wealth created as a byproduct, as a spinoff right. um, of of it. the wealth is that both parties are better off. And of course, right. this is just a simple uh, isolated exchange, but in, in an advanced economy, there's trillions and trillions of these things, and there's networks of exchanges. And every time one of these things happens, um, there's benefits. Other than the concrete benefit to the party party that has uh, right, so it's an order that's that larger than that's that that lives outside of anyone's direct intention. And you and I have talked about another thing that has not been recognized is, for example, you know, if if a group of people engage in a certain type of endeavor and they're successful or they're failures, then are they set prices in a certain way? Then that is a spinoff sort of effect that benefits everyone else because they can, it, at the very least, they can observe. And learn from that, right? Which is one of the perverse effects of IP is they try to have it both ways. You try to introduce a new product into the market, which is going to teach people what is or is not a popular product or service right. to provide to customers, and you're trying to capture those benefits without facing the competition that would naturally result. But in a in a truly free market, um, that is a, a benefit to society as a whole. You do you get to witness what people try. And what they succeed at, and what they fail at. So that is another free rider benefit or a public good. That if you have this uh, sort of Chicago mentality, you might think it's a bad thing that we have to privatize everything. We have to internalize all these costs. But I think it's a great, glorious blessing of freedom and interaction in society. We all benefit incalculably from society. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think. Um... I don't think that this, there's been a consciousness of this, uh, really. Um, at least for me, anyway. It took me a while to kind of wrap, and I'm still not entirely reconciled to it. I mean, to understand the nature of, well, just for example, I think we've thought about invention as being entirely a, a, a process of, of individuals sort of fiddling with their own resources, or maybe in cooperation with others that with whom there's a formal arrangement within the structure of the firm, right? But in the open source world, um, you're basically inviting the whole community to, to come in and, and fiddle and play uh, with you, even though they're not, they don't have any kind of direct proprietary interest uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the results, they may or may not, right? So um, that's a difficult notion to sort of get around, the other, the, uh, to wrap your brain around in a way. And the other thing um, is this whole idea of... Uh, of a, sort of a potentially infinitely distributed um, copies of, of the same um, outcomes of this crowd open source uh, uh, development process so that the results of, of the improvements are immediately, instantly become kind of a common property of the globe. They become sort of more or less so socialistically distributed um, thanks, to, uh, th thanks to the network. Uh, that 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 lives outside of any 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 one single person's control. I mean, you have to admit that this is some pretty weird stuff in some way. I mean, from, from if you look at it from the point of view of like 19th century style libertarianism, this is pretty edgy, hard to account for. It is, and I think so. As you and I were talking earlier, um, uh, my growing perspective is that if you look at human evol evolution, civilization, it's pretty much static for the last. 10,000 years. The standard of living 500 years ago wasn't that much greater than 10,000 years ago or right. 2,000 years ago. Um, 1,800 or so, 200 years ago, something happened, and 
the explanations for that vary. Um, I don't really think it matters really yet, and I don't know if we can figure this out yet because our perspective is so short, but it's true that it's happened. So you see this exponential curve, the Industrial Revolution is what I'm talking about, right? Um, the overcoming right. Of, of the Malthusian trap, etc. Right. And it looks to me and to you and to others like we're reaching another inflection point on this curve, and things are even going crazier in probably or hopefully a good way. Um, how do we explain it? I don't know, but how do we ra grapple with it? I think a lot of the concerns of the past are going to fade away if things go well. Um, we were concerned with you know just feeding the masses of people before. That's now, right. Now, now, we're, now there's talk about a post-scarcity society. In a way, I think this is overblown, but in a way, I think it's a fundamental transformation. Um, I think – you will never – now, maybe my artificial intelligence sort of science fiction geek vision is not enough, great enough to really believe Right. This. You're entirely too bourgeois about this, I have to say, Stefan. Well, you know, I do what I can. Um, <laughs> but I think that – I put it this way in a podcast I did with Michael Shanklin the other day, and my friend Harrison Fishberg emailed me after, and he says he, – he focused on one phrase I used, and he said, did you – have you talked about this for a while, or did you just come up with it? And what I said was something like, all these Bitcoin things and all these processes we use are sort of like um, um, human constructions that are imposed on top of the, the, the substruct of reality. In other words, reality is always there. The right. world is always there. And once you have a system of property rights and a regular set of usage rights in those things… What people can do based on top of that is unimaginable and is incredible, but you don't have to create a second set of property rights on top of that because it's already taken care of. Right. So in the, in this case of the distributed network, <clears throat> people already own the computers. You know, the 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 lines of the internet are already are already laid through free enterprise and and private property rights. You already own your body and the space in which you inhabit, or whatever. And so then. There's this sort of outpouring, this flourishing, this flowering of of an uh, incomprehensibly complex order on on top of that foundation. Yes, yes. Right. I, I mean, you you could again, I, uh, you you could think of um, like language. Language is something that we all benefit from, we all participate in. Um, you could ask these angst-filled metaphysical questions about who owns the the language. Or who is responsible? Uh, okay, for that's creating. a really good analogy, right? But 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 it is something that we all benefit from. It did right. merge, right? And we all participate in it. But that's I don't right. think language has right. an owner. No offense, right. to the French the French government, right. you know. But right. <laughs> but right. and there's other things too. Other right. institutions, the scientific method, right. uh, the metric system, right? You know, whatever you want to talk. I, about. I mean, basically, all human knowledge <laughs> is is is. Publicly owned in that in, in that non non state public ownership in that sense all all human knowledge is maybe maybe in that we just category. have to recognize that we're lucky that we're, there's a timeline of human civilization and the the later you are down that timeline right to a certain point the luckier you are because you inherit and step on top of the work yeah. accumulated by human society in the past but it doesn't have an owner I don't think right. So so really the only thing unique about our times is that we have very advanced, efficient technologies for the distribution and uh, codification and uh, accumulation of this, of this knowledge that we haven't had in the past, and by which I mean the digital world, right? So instead of just being word, word, word of mouth, you know, hanging around in, in bars in, in, in large cities or whatever. Now we have a kind of a, a, a global, permanently growing and ever-evolving actual archive of this human knowledge. And the fact that more and more uh, things are being poured into this sort of knowledge pool, right? So it used to be text, and then it's, it's images, then it's, it's movies, and, and now physical objects, and now, you know, potentially... Uh, financial, monetary systems, and legal systems themselves. Yeah, and you you have uh, you have these layers upon layers upon layers. So you have all this knowledge, this raw data in a sense, pouring into the internet. So it's available at everyone's finger fingertips. But then people come up with ways to 
organize it at a certain level, and then right. someone comes up with a meta metadata or meta meta level on top of that to organize it yet another way, and the the end is not in sight. I don't know the the end potential of it. Um, there there is a um, I, I, like I said earlier, I do think that quantitative change can result in a qualitative change at a certain point. Um, it becomes so different in, in 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 quantitative terms that it becomes different in kind. Um, right. There, there, there's a um, I don't know if it's a metaphor or a way of looking at things, but I think Douglas Casey has profiled this. This thing called files, P H Y L E S. Sure. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm that beholden to that way of understanding it, but it gets that. The yeah, well, every time you say the word files, I, I think look down at my fingernails, I mean, to make sure that they're... It's not that kind either. Okay. Yeah, it's P-H-Y-L-E-S for okay. listeners. Um, but it's the idea that we are not bound by race or region or ethnicity or... Nationhood. We're yeah. bound by time still to an extent, although you can almost see a communication between the times, like... Right. In appreciation for people 30, 40 years ago, and they're they're not alive to represent to see it, but you can feel these connections even temporarily, but at least geographically. Um, and um, so, I think we're becoming more citizens of the world um, because right. of the internet and because of the modern, quick, fast, quick silver capitalist age. But let me go back to my original question because I, I'm I'm not sure entirely what. Um... What led me to ask the question has something to do, I think, with the fr frustration I feel about the rhetorical apparatus of of libertarian theory that seems to be like too limited, really, to describe um, this, this sort of dominant pe property paradigms that are emergent in our times. And I'm feeling this mainly because I have such a hard time describing to people. Uh, the way something like cryptocurrency works, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people want to know: well, is it a company who owns it? No, nobody right. owns it. It's entirely uh, owned owned by really the world, by the whole of humanity. And it's like, well, well, how does that how does that fit with sort of capitalistic ideology? Actually, if the whole world owns something so important as money, I mean, yeah, not, I the, the world owns the system, but all the units are owned privately. I mean, it's, it's just. It's a little bit mind blowing, you know, and and so I it, wonder. It is mind blowing. I, yeah. I think that people are trying to cram it into their preconceived notions, which right. they use to deal with concrete problems, which are becoming a receding problem. I mean, we don't right. worry so much about getting a bottle of water or a printer, which would cost seven thousand dollars years ago. You know, everything is becoming cheaper and easier. Um, even in the third world, we assume that at some point in our lifetimes that a lot of these scarcity problems are going to be largely solved. I think we have a feeling we're moving in that direction, and then the world is open for what people are going to do. Well, and you were the first one, I think, to point out to me something very interesting about this because um, there's a kind of school of thought out there that has long regretted um, digital media Precisely because it doesn't, it's not constrained by by scarcity. As if this is something something bad that will disincentivize production, you know, and disincentivize uh, creation. And and your answer has always been, look, uh, you know, we're not here to celebrate scarcity as such. Actually, we we would rather a, a, the world not be bound by these constraints. And within this, within the realm of information. We're, we are in fact released from this, and this is something that's that's glorious. We see a, a relentless tendency towards towards zero price, towards universal distribution, and universal prosperity. Yes, and I don't say that we can categorically say that that is a universally good phenomenon. We can see the good aspects of it. I mean, I have a good friend, and who's a friend of yours, um, who shall remain anonymous. Who he's a European gentleman, and he's a little older than you and I are, and he was. Complaining about the advent of the Walmart type uh, uh, model, where you just buy a thirty-dollar table for your patio, and then it wears out in three years, and you buy another one or whatever. Right. Whereas in the old world, you know, the European craftsmanship idea, you'd have some artisans making this kind of handmade table, you know, for for a couple of years, and you would buy it, and it would maybe cost three times as much as the Walmart thing, and it would last for three generations to be passed on. And there was this sort of nostalgic regret for the, the passing of the old sure. way of doing things. And I don't discount that. I don't say that that regret is, is, is completely irrational. 
But, but I mean, isn't that always almost always a function of price? I mean, yes. I mean, I'm always amazed at these people. It's like, well, houses are crappy now because they're made with um, uh, what do you, what do you call? You know, the chalky wall Par stuff. Particle board. Not particle board stuff, and I mean that's not what walls are made of. They're not made oh, of you particle. Mean, you know, well, I'm talking about the wood. Oh, know, the no, wood. they're made of drywall, not particle board. I mean, okay. I mean, I'm not. I don't know of a wall that's made of particle board, but I mean, you might be right in like in Houston or something. But P anyway. plywood, plywood. Is, uh, you have two by fours. You have plywood. You have solid wood, and you have particle board or or, or fabricated wood or engineered wood. They call it. But okay, yeah, but no, you're talking. You're talking about the uh, the veneer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. like you to talk about the veneer. No, I didn't mean to imply you're not an expert in, <laughs> in house building techniques. Okay, so Jeff, I've, Jeff is, I've done a couple of patents on on engineered wood, so. <laughs> And, and I'm not talking about Viagra. It's okay. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. No, I'm sure you know all about the subject. Um, <laughs> I mean, my point is that some people say, well, because it's better when they're made of cinder blocks or something like that. Well, okay, yes. you can do that, but it's just more expensive. Yes. And, um, and you can buy an iron that lasts more than a year. You can buy one that lasts 20 years, probably, if you're willing to pay pay $500. And, and similarly, what was the example you just gave? Uh, uh, oh, you can buy a finely crafted wood table, blah, blah, blah. It's going to last a generation, but who wants it, really? I mean, you can well, not, all, not only that, the, the pace of change is so, is so quick now that yeah. it, you can, it's rational as a consumer to want something, you know, not pay extra for something that's going to last for 10, 20, 30 years because you know that in three or four or five years, there's going to be a better, like, let's say for cars. Yeah. You know, if you have right. a brand new car, maybe you don't want it for 30 years because in right. five years there's going to be a car that's going to have USB right. and Wi-Fi and right. anti, you know, anti-collision things. And right. you'd rather have it have a shorter product cycle. Right. I, I don't know what the balance is, but I mean, the free market is the best thing to figure right. this out. Well, and and like in the case of just like basic household electronics and stuff, I mean, like people used to get blenders for like wedding gifts, gifts, and and keep them for like uh, you know their entire lives. You know, <clears throat> now I mean, if you gave a blender to somebody for a wedding gift, they'd be like, well, that's a little weird, isn't it? Because I can get that at Walmart for like you know seventeen dollars. I, I blame that on the Federal Reserve because you know they uh, they influenced the banking system and they they limited the way you could pay people to invest in a bank and. There was usury laws, so they would give these blenders and toasters oh, out as a gift, right? You're talking so about I think in the they, past. Yeah. yeah. No, but the, yeah, the banks would get, yeah, that's true. But I mean, the, the, the point is that there might have been higher quality in the past. I mean, certainly there was in some way. Well, but I will tell you, one, th one thing that's striking is if, in the old days, I'm sure you remember this, if you dropped the telephone when you're on the phone call, it would just bounce off the floor and you could keep going. Nowadays, if you drop your iPhone, it's crashed. It's dead. I mean, that's true. <laughs> phones have gotten better, but they are definitely more fragile now. Well, but I, you know, just the other day, um, I was at a store somewhere. I think it was in Florida, and it was a very funny story. It was like filled with knickknacks, and uh, they were selling uh, handset attachments that you can put onto your iPhone that look mm -hmm. exactly like 1960s and 70s telephones. It was so cute. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy nostalgia. But um, I mean, I mean, back to your original topic. I do think that there's something crazy going on. I I, I listen to all these uh, prognosticators. They always seem to get something wrong. You know, they're talking about the singularity or the yeah. scarcity society, and they always right. miss something on political theory or dualism. Or yeah, these people are basically socialists. I mean, many of them are. You know, but but I'm not entirely sure what I mean by that. But um, I guess I mean well they, because earlier you said socialist in a, in in a in a, uh, in a positive way in a positive way and right I think that's which because I increasingly do in a way but <clears throat> the problem is that when you get these singularity people or these post scarcity people and they they have absolutely no affection whatsoever for the basic structure of capitalism as an institution you know it makes you a little bit wary and yet I kind of understand where they're coming from because as I say if you look at the development models that are Changing the world now. They're not what you would call really capitalistic. I think they bought into this dichotomy, right? This is what like Ayn Rand was good at, like exploding dichotomies. They have bought into this dichotomy. They have a sort of good sense about the benefits of human society in the liberal realm, right? In the realm mm -hmm. of ideas and um, I won't say emotion, but expression and arts and creativity. But they have sort of adopted the kind of uh, caricature of capitalism as this mean, nasty, money-based thing, and right. they, they think money is horrible and bad. 
they don't see it as a holistic whole where they're all related and they're all part of the same system. And money and the profit motive is no no worse than um, than the desire to become a, a a prominent artist or to express yourself in the artistic yeah. world. These are all parts of the human. Um, but don't endeavor. but don't you but don't you have some sense though, Stefan, that 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 um, uh, that that our languages by heritage by by which I mean the liberal heritage our, our language is overly limited to describe the emergent realities. I mean, can can you really read Adam Smith and and understand the blockchain really? No, I I, I think. I think you're right. It is limited, and it will grow. I think it will grow. That's how concepts grow. That's how language grows. That's how right. language emerges and develops, and it will grow. Um, and in a way, you could, you could. By, you could, by the you way, could, I think you can read Hayek and understand the blockchain a little bit better. By the way, I, I think like Hayek kind of gets us a little bit closer to that. But I, I think there's some deep philosophical issue here, and the problem is I don't trust many philosophers because I keep getting into these snarls and snags with people who are good-meaning, common sense, regular people who want liberty, but they keep getting caught up in these – like they'll talk about a Bitcoin, and they'll say does it exist or does it not exist, and because someone first labeled it as a Bitcoin, now they think of it as a coin. Right. And, and as I pointed out in this recent podcast I did… They keep saying, "Well, Bitcoin is should be pro subject to property rights because it's it's scarce." But then they always add the, the next phrase, which you always hear, "within a system." Now, I've never noticed that in regular property rights. I never noticed that um, a piece of land in a particular location on the Earth is scarce within a system. It just is actually the only one there. So they keep adding this qualifier within a system, and so. I'm like, well, if you just redescribe functionally what Bitcoin is, it's a ledger system that some people voluntarily cooperate yeah. in. It's right. distributed. Then would you call a pointer or a, a series of numbers, quote, within a system, would you call that a property right? And if so, to what? Who agreed to what? There's no agreement that I'm aware of. So there's all this um, conceptual confusion um, about the system, and I think people are – their minds naturally gravitate towards what they're used to. They naturally think, hey, we're part of the West. We're part of a capitalist society. There's property rights in these things. It creates incentives. It, cre it overcomes the public uh, goods problem, the you know the, uh, the the tragedy of the commons problem, the free rider problem. There's incentive effects. This is how the world works, and they use that model to try to understand this emerging Bitcoin framework. Whereas I think it's the other way around. I think that the the people that created Bitcoin, either explicitly and intentionally, or just by by uh, by by being part of it, they were modeling aspects of a free market system that works. But that doesn't mean it's the same thing, right? They took parts of it that worked, and they're taking advantage of that. So, for example, the idea of property rights is to have the legal right to control of a resource, which you right. need to control to get something done in the world. And that's what law is for and what rights are for. It's the legal recognition of the ability to control. But if you were alone on a desert island, you would have the practical control of resources to, to make your fishnets and to make your hut and to whatever. And the Bitcoin situation is sort of in between. It's an amalgam. You have the practical control of this ledger entry, and because other people are participating because of the network effect… It has a usefulness to you. You don't have the legal right to control, but you don't really need it, but it's analogous to the legal right to control. So in a way, it's better than the legal right to control even though there's no legal right to control. So everyone talks about it as ownership. Well, I own my Bitcoins. When they say that, what they mean is you have the right to control the Bitcoin. Right. Well, what they really mean is you have the power to control the Bitcoin, and that is true because you have the combination. You, know, you have the key. You have the password. But it doesn't mean that it's the same thing as an ownable resource. So I think we need to – we could be lazier 30, 40 years ago in our right. concepts, but yeah. with the emergence of the internet, the emergence of digital goods, the emergence and the uh, – Distributed say, networks. Well, I would also say with, with 
intellectual property becoming a huge problem and basically engulfing all these systems where before it was sort of in the background. It's time to get these concepts straight and think clearly about everything. And I think well, this a is lot the of us problem, are trying to I do think. that. I think this is the this is the problem I, I think I think we face. We don't really have uh, uh, intellectual resources to to get straight on, on on these topics within the within the old fashioned liberal framework. And that this is why yeah, I, I think that's the genesis of your question. original question. I think yeah, you're this right. Is, this is what concerns me. Um, actually you're looking is, for a vocabulary or for a language to start to categorize and identify features of the modern world. The digital world that we can now start to analyze and right. Understand. I mean, if 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 we're marching in parades holding a banner that says private property rights, mm -hmm. um, you know, how does that actually speak to a world in which the most spectacular things we're seeing all around us actually seem to defy that very idea? You know, this is this is the problem. I mean, a simple, curt explanation, good for you know, sixty minutes or something, would be that. You couldn't imagine this happening in a communist society. Now, there's a reason for right. that. It happens on the substrate of a private property system, um, but how to connect all the dots up is not easy. And well, it requires a tremendous imagination. It requires uh, really – I mean it requires something like actually what Bastiat spelled out you know, uh, in his work about this sort of imagining a, an order greater, greater than – than the one that you yourself are controlling, you know, and and seeing that as the overarching result and framework that sustains the social order, so, something gigantic and and wonderful. Uh, the the harmonies, you know, he called it economic harmonies. I think is, is what which is nothing. Again, back to the invisible hand. It's really nothing more to this than to say that being part of society it means something, and makes right. us different, and is valuable. I mean, it makes you as an individual. You're still an individual. But you are right. part of a society which makes your identity different than it would be otherwise, right. and better, and and hopefully and presumably better, but definitely different. And 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 the beneficiary of of something spectacular and and huge that that goes way beyond the idea of what what is what is yours as a as a proprietary owner. I mean. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, Maybe what we're getting at is that the nature of society is changing. What I, it mean, what yeah. society is is changing. Society well, might, used to be bound up with with geographic and national borders that's it. and, Maybe that's and it. race and ethnicity and language, and right. now it's transforming. It's it's, right. it's it's leaping past its borders. We're becoming right. one, you know, one realm of of society that's. Leaping past its previous well, I mean, uh, confines. I think you're right. I mean, look, like the day before yesterday, practically, <laughs> the only way to conduct exchange, to, to really have mutually beneficial exchange with anybody, uh, was geographic. Yeah, you could send your goods on a boat or whatever, um, but, but basically, it was it was always physical and therefore geographic. Yes. In the end, but but like within the last few years, we're, we've we've discovered ways to kind of like dispense with geography and have real tradable goods uh, in in this digital digital realm where you can see whole economies emerging you know peer to peer on a global basis with no geographic contingencies whatsoever maybe I that's guess, the real issue i think one dilemma we face is should we or should we not take for granted all the amazing things that happen every year on the one hand, you could see why people do take it for granted, right? I mean, you know, there's a new iPhone announced. Well, like, what, what, yeah. the iPhone's what seven, eight years old, right? And now right. it's transformed the entire smartphone and computer and communication industry. And, there's, and now the iPhone's been bested by open source technology. And so we, I mean, it's really only seven years old, let's say, and it's one of the most transformative uh, innovations in all of human history. And we take it for granted, and in a way, that's cool that we take it for granted. But as thinkers and as people trying to understand where we are, we we probably try we should try not we should try to not take things for granted too much and try to sit back and analyze and appreciate how things happened and why they happened. So I think we have to appreciate it, but it's it's good that we can take it for granted. It's good that you can take for granted that you can go see a movie or, or go down right. the street or call a guy to repair your your appliance or 
change your car every seven years or whatever. And it's it's good. It's good to have luxuries, but it's also good to be aware of maybe where it comes from and where the the next you know the next stage is coming from too. And you know, iPhone is probably not even the best example. Actually, the most remarkable thing is the way in which. Um, the iPhone technology and operating system has been bested by, um, you know, this new model of distributed networks and right. free software and open source, open source development, and you know the global app economy, which is you know, you know, working almost without gatekeepers at this point. You know, yes, um, you know that that stuff is is unbelievable. Uh, there's an there's an element to this too that's important for the prospects for human liberty because, I mean, I've said this in several recent speeches. Um, you know that that the idea of the distributed network is is really the sort of the how do you say the the killer app for the state. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> states are always bound up with geography, uh, contained within a map and and limited in in their um, in, in their power according to the space they can control. But the distributed network sort of sort of lives everywhere and it's unkillable ultimately. Um, no matter how how many states gang up against it, it's 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 not going to happen. I used the example the other day, in a speech that you know I could collect all calculators in the room, but I couldn't collect everybody's math knowledge over math. Actually, <laughs> it's just not not possible. No despot in the world can get rid of mathematics. Right. I, uh, I don't know if that's a uh, a pro Hayekian or anti Hayekian point. I guess it's pro Hayekian in a sense. <laughs> um, I, I think I heard Russ Roberts make a similar point just about why are there still economics professors? They're, yeah. they're, they're teaching from textbooks that have you know been retreaded for decades now. Mm-hmm. So why are they being paid these reasonable, you know, pretty nice salaries? Um, they're not recreating it. They're just being paid to teach it. Right. Because you can't, at least not yet, you can't put it into a computer program or some algorithm. Exactly how you teach people. It's a skill. It's an art. Well, it's a scarce service. I don't think it's really a mystery, actually. I mean, if if we if we can get, just sort of untie the idea of the good. I mean, this is a non-scarce good, basically. Yeah, right. Right. Uh, tied to a to a scarce uh, service, meaning that you know there's only one of you, and you're using up your time, and, and that yep. sort of thing. That's what you're paid for. You're not actually paid for the good of economic knowledge. It's not a good. It's an exactly infinite, infinitely available thing. Uh, the reason it's economically viable to to charge for it um, um, is is probably because it's a scarce a scarce service. I mean, I was about to say there's also also the uh, also tax dollars help in that respect. <laughs> True. True. But, but there, there's a healthy private university market in the country. Yeah, that, that's professors. right. That's why I didn't yeah, actually yeah. take yeah. the cheap shot. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's distorted. We all know that. <laughs> and there are professors we would uh, we would think, why are they being paid for this nonsense? You know. But um, yeah, no, I totally well, agree. Listen, I'm not gonna keep you any more, Stephen. It's lovely to visit with you, and I hope we get a chance to to visit again real soon. Well, of course we will. It'll probably be tomorrow morning, right? Yeah, tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye.